Hello and welcome. Tonight, President Muhammad Buhari again warns unauthorized persons against carrying rifles, also tells Igbo leaders that the court is to decide fate of Anamdi Kanu. Vice President Professor Ime Shibajo and former Governor of Lagos State Bola Tinubu attend meeting of Southwest APC presidential aspirants in Lagos, convened by APC elders in the region. More presidential aspirants join race on platform of the All Progressives Congress. CBN Governor Godwin Emefele, Minister of Science and Technology Ogbonnaya Onu, and former Governor of Zamfara State Sonny Yerima. And on business news tonight, Nigerian upstream regulator commences full-scale audit to assess crude oil theft in the petroleum industry. And from Abuja, the Supreme Court today resolved ownership dispute on 17 oil wells between Imo and River State. Rules in favor of River State also dismisses counterclaim by the Imo State government. And in international news from London, a new attempt to rescue civilians trapped in the Mariupol steelworks is underway. We begin with the highlight of the president's visit to a Boeing state, which is the condemnation of activities of terror groups wreaking havoc on innocent citizens in the southeast. President Muhammadu Buhari was speaking during a conversation with elders of Igbo land in Abakalike, the Boeing state capital. On the appeal by elders to have the detained leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra released, the president explains that the law will take its course. The interactive session is an expansive one attended by members of the traditional institutions, religious communities and sociocultural organizations from the Southeast. President Buhari is warmly received by the Indibo community and this rare interaction with him at close range is an opportunity for the Southeast community to be frank about issues affecting the region, including the appeal for amnesty for IPUB leader Namdi Kano. I can only ask you for one thing, Mr. President, as an elder. As I told you on the 18th of November last year, I want to see peace in this country before I join my ancestors. I want to see peace in the Southeast, particularly where there is all sorts of crisis. And there's something that will lead to that peace, that will help us to settle that peace. It's just around the corner. And I ask you, Mr. President, give me the mandate. Give me the mandate. Give me the person I want. And I'll give you peace. I'll give you peace. I guarantee you that, Mr. President. Responding to issues raised by his host, President Buhari said the appeal for the release of the IPUB leader is a matter within the purview of the courts. He also condemned killings in the southeast, saying anyone carrying weapons without due authorization is an enemy of the state. I have listened carefully to the various appeals from the elders to the traditional leaders regarding a wide range of options. And as I have said previously, this matter remains in the full view of the court where it will be properly educated. Terrorists who unfortunately have also brainwashed a certain segment of the population that continue to contribute their hard earned funds towards their hate filled messages but now have them terrorized through their brutal killings, truncation of commercial activities restriction of freedom of movement and the ability to exercise basic human rights must be fleshed out from amongst us and that can only be done with the support of the people. My worry is for our hardworking and innocent civilians for whom life is already tough and would like to just go out and earn a decent, honest living. I will once again repeat, no one has the right to carry an AK-47 rifle, 
and anyone seen in any part of the country doing so and is not a law enforcement officer is a threat to our peaceful coexistence and should be treated as such. On the 2023 general elections, the president stated his commitment to a free and fair process. During his two-day working visit, President Buhari commissioned some landmark projects, including the five-kilometer dual carriage airport, and commended Governor Mai for the quality of work done in execution. And to politics, the meeting of the presidential aspirants on the platform of the All Progressives Congress in the Southwest, conveyed by the former governor of Oshun State, Mr. Bisiya Konde, and the former governor of Ogun State, Ushegmo Shoba, held today in Lagos House Marina. Present at the meeting with Vice President Professor Yemir Shibajo, the former governor of Lagos State, Bola Tinubu, Speaker of the House of Representatives, governors of Lagos, Ogun, Oshun. Uh, ministers of Works and Housing, Trade, Industry and Investment, Minister of Interior, among others. At the end of the meeting, it was agreed that the aspirants should pursue their ambitions devoid of hostility and that the ultimate was for everyone uh, to have a presidential candidate of the party from the Southwest. Meanwhile, earlier in the day, the Vice President, Professor Yumi Shibajo, was in a number of states to meet APC delegates ahead of the presidential primary election. The APC aspirant also paid a curtsy visit to the Anambra State Governor, where he assures of the federal government's resolve to ensure the safety of citizens everywhere in the country. It's the turn of Anambra State they host the Vice President, Professor Yemi Shibajo as he continues his march towards 2023. His itinerary has him lined up to meet with delegates of the All Progressive Congress. But first on protocol is a courtesy visit of the governor, Professor Chukuma Soludo, who extolled the vice president's leadership role in arranging economic policies. I must state without a full vocation and uh, that Mr. Vice President also coordinating several of the special intervention programs that the federal government has uh, enunciated. It has been leading us well. I think on the matter of security, and this is a matter of course that Professor Shibajo shares more than economic insights, touching on security issues and the federal government's drive towards solving the challenges. One of the important uh, steps that the president is taking from the meeting is straight to a closed door session with delegates eager to hear what the professor has in store for the country the expectation of the delegates seems to have been met by the vice president uh, i think he has answers to all the questions and is well prepared if by the grace of god and by the grace of the delegates across the federation he clenches the ticket of this party he will become a very good president he's a man of his word his integrity is second to none he's somebody that he's, he listens to you he dialogue issues with you and that is what we need in leadership, transformational. He look at things and know the best solution. With a number concluded on the timetable, preparation for the next post of call will be the line of action of the vice president's campaign team. Staying with the 2023 race and barely 24 hours before, uh, after his declaration for president, former Ogun State Governor Senator Ibikuni Amosu today presented his expression of interest in nomination forms to the national chairman of the party, Senator Abdullahi Adamu in Abuja. Senator Amosu says he is ready for any mode of primaries that will be decided by the leadership of the party. There is a saying that uh, you do not uh, say everything uh, to the public, other than for me to come and pay to let chairman know I've actually taken the form and that uh, you're like a lawyer party man, we will just uh, continue to run around to continue with the consultation and uh, go for the primaries. So that's what I came to inform the chairman. What's your favorite move at the primaries? 
any of the option, I mean, as long as uh, the party decides. So we have to follow all of us. And I want to believe that uh, every one of us that have shown intention will abide by uh, the rulings of the party. If the party says we are going to do uh, any of the mode of election, I want to believe that uh, I will, I can speak for myself, that whatever the party says, I will have to abide by it. For me, uh, one, the more the merrier, that is democracy at play. Number two, it shows that we have the materials in the South. Yes, as many as we could. We are saying that all of us are eminently qualified, and this is without prejudice to what people are saying. I think uh, we are all eminently qualified to run the affairs of this country. So for me, uh, yes, people may say that, oh, we are too many, but I think that is uh, the essence of politics. That is the beauty of democracy, and we should all uh, just let it be. And for the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, it's no more in the realm of speculations as his associates today picked the APC presidential form for him. The All Progressives Congress now has more than 20 aspirants, including Mr. Godwin Emefile. The presidential race on the platform of the APC is building up, and it remains to be seen how the party's leadership will prune down the number of aspirants and select a candidate for the party ahead of 2023. Meanwhile, two more presidential aspirants on the platform of the APC, uh, the Minister of Science and Technology, Dr. Bunaya Onu, and former Governor of Zamfara State, Sonia Irima, joined the race today, declaring at separate events in the nation's capital. While Dr. Onu believes he has all it takes to unlock the nation's prosperity, the former Zamfara State Governor says he's the best man for the job. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Mizuke, reports. A latest addition to the presidential race is former Zamfara State Senator Ahmed Yerima, who joins the race for the ticket of the All Progressives Congress. I want to pledge that I will not let them down. Earlier, he visited the presidential villa. He told State House correspondents that he will tackle the tripartite issues of insecurity, poverty, and ignorance. I'm here this afternoon to inform Mr. President of my intention to participate in the 2023 election and to contest the office of the President of the Republic of Nigeria. Uh, I'm very happy with the reception and uh, the advice is given to me. There is still a lot of ignorance in our society. So if I'm elected by the grace of God, I'm going to be elected under the Constitution and I'm going to take an oath to protect and defend the constitution of Nigeria. So I will never do anything unconstitutional. Separately, one of the president's cabinet members who is currently a minister of science, technology and innovation, Dr. Obunaya Onu, joins the list of presidential aspirants. I most respectively ask my political party, the All Progressives Congress, to elect me as its presidential candidate and, and the people of Nigeria to elect me as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. At his declaration, Dr. Onu is confident that he has the keys to unlocking the nation's prosperity. Let no one tell us that it cannot be done because because if we cannot achieve it, our children can. So far, the APC has recorded 23 aspirants for the presidential ticket, as the party expects more in the coming days. Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. In part two, after the break, People's Democratic Party National Executive Council promises presidential aspirants of level playing ground, plus... Supreme Court resolves all worlds dispute, and this is ownership dispute, between Emo and River State. Please stay with us.
Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channel Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. President Mohamed Buhari again warns unauthorized persons against carrying rifles. Also tells Igbo leaders that the court is to decide fate of Namdi Kanu. Vice President Professor Yumi Ochibadu and former Lagos Governor Bola Tinubu attend meeting of Southwest APC presidential aspirants in Lagos convened by APC elders in the region. TBN Governor, Minister of Science and Technology and former Governor of Zamfara State join the list of presidential aspirants on the platform of the All Progressives Congress. And Chairman, Channels Media Group, Dr. John Momo, identifies synergy between media and the military as a catalyst for managing public opinion in the interest of national security. To continue with politics, political associates and friends of the APC presidential aspirant and Minister of Transportation, Chibikami Chi, have purchased his expression of interest and nomination form. The form was presented to him in Abuja in the presence of some politicians led by Senator Aline Dume. As part of efforts projecting the presidential aspiration of the Minister of Transportation, Honorable Chibiki Amechi, some of his associates have joined hands together to purchase the expression of interest and nomination forms for him. I'm privileged to, on behalf of all of us here, especially your special friends, who put together the money necessary to buy this Leader of the team, Senator Ali Undume, on behalf of the members, presents the forms to him in Abuja. Speaking with newsmen after the presentation, Senator Undume expresses delight in the nationwide support Mr. Amechi is receiving in his presidential aspiration. Senator Ndume equally restates his confidence that the aspirant will reposition Nigeria on the path of development owing to his experience and achievements in political leadership. As you know, he was a speaker in, 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 uh, in River State for eight years. He was a governor for eight years. And then <clears throat> eventually he is now a minister for eight years, minister for a stra very strategic and visible ministry. So that's why we say, look, why don't we... Uh, put our hands, our heads together, put our resources together and get him the, uh, the form that he needs to run. Honorable Amechi, on his part, appreciates his associates for the kind gesture. He promises that he will be a good president if eventually elected. Uh, I will bring my experience to bear if, if I'm given the opportunity to be able to address some of these issues that we are not able to, we are not able to uh, address, to uh, ensure that the people of Nigeria feel happy with us, we continue to vote for us the way they voted for APC. And like I said in the bottom, it's about the electability of the candidates. I come from the South-South, and I'm sure I serve the interests of every Nigerian. And I'm not a, a regional candidate, I'm a Nigerian candidate. Other top politicians present at the event include former senators Ifan Yararume, Ayogweze, Nuruddin Abatemi Usman, and the APC governorship candidate in Bayelsa State, David Lyon, among others. And now to the People's Democratic Party. The National Working Committee of the party says it is going through pressure from members ahead of the party's presidential primary. Notwithstanding, the committee, however, promises the party members that it will ensure that all aspirants contest on a level playing field. The national chairman of the party, Senator Yocha Ayu, today met with the Sokoto State Governor, Aminu Tambuwal, who is one of the 15 presidential aspirants cleared for the party's primaries on the 28th and 29th of May. We, as a national working committee, in spite of the pressure on us, we are working around the clock to make sure that we provide a strong platform and we provide not just a level playing field, but transparently so. So be rest assured that come 28th of this month, we shall all gather in a place in Nigeria and give you the necessary atmosphere to present yourself to the party's uh, <laughs> delegates 
and your votes, their votes will be counted very openly, as we always do. And at the end of the day, if it's the will of God and the delegates that it is you that emerges, we will also be sure that the party will be in a very safe hand. Meanwhile, two presidential aspirants of the People's Democratic Party are asking delegates to the 2023 presidential primaries to prioritize capacity over ethnic or religious considerations in the quest to choose a presidential candidate for the party. The aspirants, former Senate presidents Bukola Saraki and Paim Pius Ayim, made the appeal in Abuja when they met separately with delegates from Zamfara and Kogi states. Please. It's less than a month to the PDP presidential primaries, and aspirants are unrelenting as they canvass for the support of delegates to clinch the party's ticket. In two separate meetings with delegates in Abuja, former Senate presidents Bukola Saraki and Ayim Pius Ayim canvassed for votes ahead of the May 28 and 29 PDP convention to choose a presidential candidate. We had this country on the path of security where you can travel from Abuja to Zamfara without any fear. But today, this is where we are. Do you know the problem? Leadership. And it's the leadership that will bridge that gap. That is what I'm offering. Are you ready to go with me? Yes. yes. I appeal to you, as you go back, that I will, all the delegates you shall allow in Zamfara State to vote for me so that I'll use that opportunity as a doctor to make life better for our children, for our women, and ensure that there'll be free health. You will not need to pay any more. On the issue of zoning, Saraki appeals to the delegates to prioritize capacity over ethnic or religious considerations. We should not go by uh, where you come from, uh, what you worship, and what language. Those days are gone. I believe that. Uh, I would like to see that this is a watershed in the history of this country, that going forward from now, we start talking about how, how can you perform. With and just three weeks to the planned presidential primaries and having engaged many aspirants, some of the delegates seem to have made up their minds. We have come to see him. We are not coming to play politics with him because we are brothers. And we will support our brother. 17 presidential aspirants initially wanted the PDP presidential ticket, but the number was pruned down after the party screened out two aspirants, clearing 15 to compete for the party's tickets. And to other stories, according to a press release by the British High Commission in Abuja, the British government says... Quote, we are aware of inaccurate reporting circulating in the media and online that the UK government has added the indigenous people of Biafra IPOB to the UK's list of terrorist groups or organizations banned under UK law. These reports are untrue. The indigenous people of Biafra IPOB is not a prescribed organization in the United Kingdom. It says the inaccurate reporting relates to 13 April 2022 publication by the UK government of a revised country policy and information note, CPIN, in, on separatist groups in southeast Nigeria, including the indigenous people of Biafra. CPINs provide country of origin information, COI, and analysis of COI for use by UK government decision makers handling particular types of protection and human rights claims. It says all asylum and human rights claims made in the UK are considered on their individual facts in accordance with their obligations under the UN Refugee Convention and European Convention on Human Rights, taking into account relevant background country information and case law. It continues that the CPIN on separatist groups in the southeast, including the indigenous people of Biafra IPOB, provides a general assessment of risks faced by individuals belonging to those groups. It says these assessments are based on an analysis of publicly available country information obtained from a wide range of reliable sources, including media outlets, UK and other governments, local, national and international organizations, and non-government organizations. 
It says this CPIN is also acknowledges that the Nigerian government has prescribed IPOB as a terrorist organization. Some members of IPOB have reportedly used violence against the state and members of the public and advises that persons who have committed human rights abuses must not be granted protection. Well, before the published disclaimer by the British High Commission in Abuja today, the Nigerian government had reacted to the report earlier in the media. In a statement signed by the senior special assistant to the president on media and publicity, Mr. Garba Shehu, the violent secessionist organization has long been prescribed as such in Nigeria, where it carries out the majority of its murderous activities. It says he, it has taken our allies in the UK so long to follow suit, owing to two reasons. First, the deep pocket of IPOB's international network of funders that allow for lawyers and influence peddlers to aggressively lobby for and whitewash activities of their clients in Western courts. And second, IPOB's influential communication network of TV and radio stations, including London-based Radio Biafra, employed with great effect to spread misinformation abroad and incite violence at home. He continues, the next steps are clear. Now that IPOB has rightly been designated a terrorist group, the UK authorities should, in our view, follow up with confiscation of their assets, shut down their communication channels, and, section, and sanction rather, the issuance of visas to IPOB's funders in Nigeria. Such sanctions, he says, have played a crucial, critical role in combating other terror groups and make no mistake, today Africa is a breeding ground for terror with local and international groups alike gaining strength across the continent, thriving on the economic devastation of the pandemic. It says Nigeria's intelligence and security forces are the first lines of defense against such groups, including ISIS and Al-Qaeda-affiliated Boko Haram. It says we rely on their allies in the West for their support. It continues that IPOB and its 50,000 strong paramilitary units reign of terror has seen villages butchered, school buses set to light and politicians' homes bombed through their international network of radio and television stations. It continues that they threaten further violence if their demands are not met while inciting violence and religious and ethnic tension between Nigerians, Christian and Muslim populations. The statement continues saying that their mouthpieces and their wallets are their most effective tools. It is these assets Nigeria's allies must target next and there is no time for complacency. It wrapped up by saying that they thank the UK for its decisive action, calling on their friends in the US to at least at last heed the calls and follow suit in designating the murderous terror group as what it is. Across Africa, increasingly, what were once small localized groups, he says, are growing in size and influence and becoming connected to global networks of terror. It continues that the free and democratic world must act now to stone them out before any more misery is caused. Still ahead on the news at 10. We have one more report on the lecture at the Walk College by Dr. John Momo Plus. Business news with stories on the Nigerian upstream regulator commencing full-scale audits to assess crude oil theft in the petroleum industry. That's on business news. Do join us again. Now we turn our attention to our Buja studios where Mark Wegu Yusuf is roaring to go. Hi, Mark Wegu. Hello, Millicent. Shall we say thank God it's Friday? After years of litigation, the Supreme Court today resolved the ownership dispute in 17 oil wells in favor of the River State Government. In a judgment prepared by Justice Ellen Ogumumiju, or delivered by Justice Emmanuel Agim, the Apex Court dismissed the counterclaim ownership put forward by the Imo State Government. According to Justice Agim, reliefs 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6 sought by the River State Government were granted by the court, which includes that oil wells within Akri and Mbede communities are all oil wells within the territory of River State and belong to it. The Apex Court, however, declined to grant River State's prayer that Imo be made to refund all revenue that may have been wrongly paid the state. 
Meanwhile, the River State Governor, Yes Amwiki, has criticized the former governor of Imo State, Emeka Ihedioha, for jettisoning the arrangements between his state and Imo State over the disputed oil wells. Mr. Wike, who was reacting to the Supreme Court ruling which awarded the wells to River State, says Mr. Ihedioha had cancelled the political arrangements between the two states for the revenue from the disputed oil wells to be shared equally between the two states. At a stakeholders' meeting in Port Harcourt, the River State capital, Governor Wiki says Mr. Ihedioha's action was born out of a selfish move to acquire the entire proceeds from the wells. It's a joyful day for the people of River State following a Supreme Court judgment which grants it the exclusive ownership of about 17 oil wells disputed with Imo State. The dispute had been given a political solution since 1999 when Governors Peter Audley of River State and Achiko Denwa of Imo State agreed to share the proceeds from the wells equally. That arrangement was, however, discarded by the former governor of Imo State, Emeka Ihedioha, who obtained a presidential directive to solely claim the revenue from the wells, an action that pushed the present administration of River State to approach the courts, and an action to which it was granted victory. This gathering of River State leaders is at the instance of Governor Yesam Wike to intimate them on the development and give his opinion on the matter. The Supreme Court has finally and conclusively resolved the dispute and granted full and exclusive ownership of all the disputed oil wells in our and Middle East field to River State, much to everyone's relief. Now that the Supreme Court has spoken, we hope Governor Hobo Salima will accept the outcome in good faith, refrain from usual dark tribes against the judiciary, and explore possible pathways to accommodation and compromise from the River State government. He is, however, extending an olive branch to the Imo State government. The quest to defend our ownership rights through the courts over the Akiri and Mbide Oye was, was not intended to claim victory over Imo or any other state. We are therefore open to further discussions with the government of Imo State on the best way forward without prejudice to the outcome of today's judgment. Governor Wike is being commended for his tenacity to protect the interests of the state, as some leaders believe it's a testament to his capability to govern the country. We are jubilating because God Almighty, through you, has restored the oil blocks. And in 50 billion, I know the number of flyovers that can face for the This victory hopefully puts to rest the dispute over the oil wells. Well, away from the ruling and reactions to it, the chairman of Channels Media Group, Dr. John Momo, has been speaking on the need for greater cooperation between the military and the media as the country navigates the challenges of insecurity and fake news. He was speaking today at the National Defense College in Abuja while delivering a lecture titled Managing the Media and Public Opinion During Crisis to the 98 participants of Course 30 at the Nigeria Defense College. The lecture is coming three months before the end of Course 30 and forms part of the theme for the course, which aims at exposing the participants who are mostly high-ranking military personnel to a whole new approach to handling human security. Our correspondent Kayla Megua reports. It is a crucial lecture day. 102 participants from the three armed services, ministries and agencies, and other participants from 16 countries are eager to soak in brand new ideas on how to manage the media and public opinions in times of crisis. Outside the hall, bright and early at 9 a.m., the chairman of Channels Media Group, Dr. John Momo, makes his way onto the grounds of the 28-year-old National Defense College the apex military training institution for the Nigerian Armed Forces. He is received by the college commandant, Rear Admiral Mortala Bashir. Straight to the podium, Dr. Momo lays bare the critical role the media plays in molding public opinion, engendering national unity, and why the military must manage the media properly. In times of national crisis, the media can engage in an organized effort to shape public opinion. 
But without a positive attitude and good management of the media, even the best efforts of policymakers and governments would not have the best possible effects. The Army's spokesman must keep his words. If he had promised to get back to the journalists who had approached him for clarification on a story he's dealing with, if this happens, the media is less likely to be antagonistic if they are treated with dignity. Although the military and the media view their mandates differently, Dr. Momo believes that to manage public opinion successfully in times of conflict, the media should be given access to information and respond to requests for information on time. He ends the lecture by stating that if the military manages the media well, it will be able to manage public opinion successfully, urging the media to practice responsible journalism. Our stations, newspapers, or platforms should not give oxygen to enemies of our country who crave media publicity to survive and operate. We must, repeat, we must practice responsible journalism in the interests of our national security. Out from the podium to the interactive session where he fields questions from participants and faculty members on sharing sensitive military information with the media, the challenges with investigative journalism in Nigeria, and the challenge of having an independent media in an era where many media houses are owned by politicians. We begin to see more and more of the kind of reportage that will come from these uh, institutions, for the most part, not balancing their stor stories, not being objective or tilted to one side, particularly those side of their ownership. So that's the way it goes. It is the regulator who has the function to make sure that things like this are checked from time to time. But as far as channels is concerned, um, we're very professional, and you can check us out in all that we do. A word of gratitude brings to an end a rare interaction between the top military personnel and a veteran media practitioner and entrepreneur. The commandant of the college is already thinking of plans to make this military media synergy seamless. As a government, we need to have an appropriate media infrastructure to adequately shape public opinion. And... Uh, Based on the lecture, we can see that there is a direct relationship, you know, between the two variables, media and public opinion. Uh, Building that synergy between the military and the media seems quite difficult, considering the fact that both agencies work at crosshairs. The military believing in secrecy and the media believing in openness. However, that synergy is one that has to be made, and that is the crux of the lecture here at the Nigerian Defense College. Uh, the chairman of the Channels Media Group make me clear that when there's a war, the first casualty is truth, and it is imperative on the media and the military to ensure that truth survives. Kayla Megua, Channels Television News. Well, that's all from our studios here in Abuja. But please stay with us as Teniola Shabawale will be taking you through business news. Welcome to Business News. The Chief Executive Officer of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, Mr. Benga Komolafe, has been speaking of recent initiatives by the Commission to improve the performance of the nation's oil and gas sector as a major revenue earner. Some of the initiatives, according to him, include the commencement of an audit of crude oil theft, advanced cargo declaration regime, which is expected to curb crude oil export theft as the validation of crude oil assets amongst others. Well, let's check in on the stock market now. Ini John Mekwa has the details. Thank you so much. Welcome to the stock market report. Well, Nigeria's stock market has gained 19% year to date, while its global pairs, such as the tech heavy Nasdaq in the United States, is down 21% year to date. Imagine that. Quite an inverse relationship we're seeing with other global equities. The all share index is even closer to that 51,000 level, affirming the bull stance in the market at almost 0.2%. 
Now, on the activity charts, we see that value shared today almost the same percentage it gained in the previous session. For the counters, consumer and industrial goods sectors have retained that bullish sentiment thanks to stocks such as Nigerian breweries, flour mills, and Cadbury. They boosted the consumer goods, while Lafarge, formerly known as Swapco, led the positive in the industrial goods. Banking has recovered more than 1%. This is attributed to Zenith, which gained 45 copper. That's what it lost yesterday, while Fidelity and FBN Holdings have joined the gainers list. The first quarter earnings report and dividends payment is not over yet, and we do hope it keeps driving the market in the positive sentiment. That's the stock market report. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And that's business news tonight. It's back to Millicent. Thanks, Daniela. And now to some international news. Here's Simon Pusey. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. A senior Ukrainian official says a new attempt to evacuate civilians trapped with Ukrainian fighters in the Mariupol steelworks is underway. It comes as Russian-backed forces continue their assault on the plant using tank and artillery fire. There are thought to be around 200 civilians, including at least 20 children, still in bunkers under the steel plant. Almost 500 civilians have been safely moved from the city since a UN-led rescue operation began. Vladimir Putin says Ukraine should order its fighters in the Mariupol plant to surrender. Several U.S. media platforms are reporting that the U.S. provided intelligence that helped Ukraine sink the Moskva, Russia's flagship Black Sea missile cruiser. Unnamed officials said Ukraine had asked the U.S. about a ship sailing to the south of Odessa. The U.S. said it was the Moskva and helped confirm its location. Ukraine then struck it with two missiles. The Pentagon has not confirmed the reports, but a spokesman said the U.S. gave intelligence to help Ukraine defend itself. A court in Belarus has sentenced a Russian student to six years in jail, one year after she and her dissident journalist partner were removed from a Ryanair plane and arrested. <laughs> Sofia Sapega was travelling with Roman Protasevich to Lithuania when their flight was forcibly diverted to Minsk. The case sparked worldwide condemnation and fresh sanctions against the government of Alexander Lukashenko. The court said she was guilty of inciting social enmity and discord. Hundreds of mourners have attended the funeral of two Israeli men killed in an attack in a central Israeli city on Thursday. A manhunt is underway for two Palestinians suspected of killing three Israelis in an axe and knife attack in central Israel. It happened in the predominantly ultra-Orthodox Jewish town of Elad. Seven others were wounded, two seriously. It is the latest in a wave of deadly attacks in Israel by Palestinians or Israeli Arabs since late March. Boris Johnson has admitted his Conservative Party has faced a tough night in some parts of England in the local elections. There were celebrations from the Labour Party, which took three symbolic London councils from the Tories, winning in Westminster, which had been controlled by the Tories since 1964, Wandsworth since 1978, and Labour took Barnet for the first time. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer described it as a big turning point for his party, but as counting continues, it is currently at a net loss of the councils outside of London. The Prime Minister said it had been a mixed set of results for the party, with gains in some places and losses in others. This has been a, uh, a, a tough night for Conservatives in, in some parts of the country, and in other parts of the, of the country uh, we're actually moving forward. And, and so uh, for midterm, it's quite interesting that it's a mixed set of, of results. The man accused of attacking U.S. comedian Dave Chappelle on stage at the Hollywood Bowl has been charged with four counts of misdemeanor and will no longer face felony charges. Los Angeles City Attorney's Office has now hit Isaiah Lee with charges including battery and possession of a weapon with intent to assault. Prosecutors concluded that the evidence did not constitute felony conduct, but added that the alleged criminal attack must have consequences. President Biden has named Karine Jean-Pierre as his new top spokesperson, the first time a black person has held the role. My colleague, my partner in truth, Karine Jean-Pierre, the next White House press secretary. 
Ms. John Pierre has served as the administration's principal deputy press secretary since Mr. Biden was elected. She will replace the outgoing press secretary, Jen Psaki, in the top role at the end of next week. Prince Harry and Prince Andrew will not appear on the Buckingham Palace balcony as part of the opening celebrations for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee next month. A palace source said the monarchy will be accompanied by members of the royal family who are currently undertaking official public duties on behalf of the Queen. There has been speculation about who will take part in the iconic royal balcony scene, waving to the crowds at the Trooping of the Colour during the next month's Platinum Jubilee weekend, which marks the Queen's 70th year on the throne. And finally, the largest diamond ever seen in auction market history could fetch 30 million US dollars in Geneva next week. The 228 carat white diamond, called the Rock, was mined and polished in South Africa over two decades ago. The auction house selling it says the war in Ukraine has also contributed to the diamond's price increase. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thank you, Simon, and welcome to Sports News. The International Paralympic Committee has banned Nigerian para-athlete Christian Madubuike for a period of three years for an anti-doping rule violation. Madubuike returned an adverse analytical finding for a prohibited substance in his urine samples provided during out-of-competition on March the 11th, 2021, and in competition on March the 19th, 2021. And that's a wrap on sports. It's back to Millicent with the wrap of the news at 10. Thank you, Victor. And the main news again. President Muhammadu Buhari again warned unauthorized persons against carrying rifles, also told Igbo leaders that the court is to decide the fate of Anamdi Kanu. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker. Have a good night and a great weekend.